Welcome back everyone to another Draft Premier League Season 7 Captain's Interview. Today we are joined by the captains of the Hisuian Offseers, uh, coached by TJ Boat and Street Cred Cookie. Please introduce yourselves. Hi everyone, I'm Street Cred Cookie, often referred to as the luckiest player alive. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Hey, how's it going? It's TJ or TJ Boat or whatever you use. Happy to be back on the happy to be back on the channel as a recurring guest. Yeah, Looking welcome. forward to the season. Welcome back. Um, so you guys are brand new captains to the Draft Premier League. You've had prior captaining experience in the past, I believe, and, and other teams. Yeah, yes, that is yeah. correct. Um, so I guess we can move right into it. Like, are there any like? Are you, are you very excited? Are you nervous for this upcoming season? Um, given, uh, I guess, the, the stakes people place onto BPL, and then do you have any like realistic expectations that you've already like discussed with each other that you want to achieve this season? Uh, I'll start. I think for me, it's definitely more so a case of excitement rather than nerves, because like for me, as someone who has basically been in the player pool every season at this point and it's like the only one that it's like got taken at every single auction without like kind of throwing their hand in the captaincy ring it was something that i really wanted to do and it was something that really excited me as a prospect so i think i'm going into the season with excitement in terms of expectations well obviously the goal is to win make playoffs and from there kind of becomes luck of the draw a little bit but I think with this going to be one of these seasons where everyone's going to be quite tightly contested. It is a very competitive season that we've got ahead of us. So I think it's just getting yourself in that top four. And then from there, anything can happen. Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited. Uh, I, I definitely, uh, I think I'm a bit new to uh, DPL. So it, it is pretty, it does make me a little bit nervous to, to be a captain. But uh, I think... It's definitely more excitement than nervous because, uh, you know, very high stakes, just really fun. Uh, and overall, I think it'll be a good experience. I think I'm pretty knowledgeable at the game, so I definitely feel like I deserve to be here. And uh, yeah, I just I feel like it'll be a good time. I think going into it, if you are nervous, like that is definitely going to have an effect on everything. Yeah. Really. And with auction being as important as it is, with drafting being as important as it is, you have to go into it. You can't be nervous from the beginning. You have to like be on the ball right from the start. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like I was already put on like on the big stage last season a lot, especially for like playoffs and stuff like that. Uh, so I'm hoping that experience can kind of give me the confidence to move forward, have a pretty good season. Overall, yeah. I think the goal for most teams is to go positive. I think that's a pretty reasonable goal. Usually puts you into playoffs, so. Uh, looking for that, honestly. Sounds pretty, um, pretty grounded, and yeah, I think ultimately most people's goal is like to just make it to the top four. Because if you make it to the top four, um, you have a pretty strong chance of just winning it all. I mean, unless you're the first seed. <laughs> True. What, first seed curse, first, man. First seed curse. One total of what? One and five in semifinals series. Yeah, I think it, that is a tough statistic. Yeah, <laughs> it's just trick by season three where the only first seeds actually win their semifinals game. Breaking is, the mold. That is a fun one for trivia. And sorry, Phil, if you're going to use that in DPL general trivia. <laughs> I guess uh, okay. transitioning from your um, your expectations, um, we can move into a couple of the changes that were made this season. So the first being that we have an entirely new format. Um, since we've introduced a fourth generation of Pokemon, we now have four tiers to play in. So before it used to be, you know, three of Sword and Shield, the current gen, and then two of the older generations. But now we have two of the current gen of Scarlet and Violet, and then one of each of the older three gens, Sword and Shield, Yu Summon, Oras, with each team being allowed to choose one extra tier um, to make the, the seven game regular season. What are your thoughts on on this um, this new format? Um, do you find it interesting? Do you find it um, pretty limiting, especially since um, we actually are drafting less drafts in total compared to previous seasons? Yeah, I'll start with this one. Uh, this is probably the biggest factor in getting me to actually sign up to be a captain. I think the new format's awesome. 
Uh, I love being given the extra element of strategy of being given a choice as to what tiers to actually play. Um, and I think it was easily the best way they could have done uh, adding a fourth tier to DPL. I think it's awesome. I'm really hyped for it. I'm in full agreement with Cookie. I think this was the only way you could do it because cutting a gen, you're bound to like annoy some people and that's just not something you want to be doing. And I think adding that extra element onto the strategy and also making the role of a captain that bit more hands-on, I think is also something that is a really cool aspect to go into for DPL for now and for subsequent seasons, I guess, if it succeeds. Yeah, because if it, it is successful, you know, there's the, the prospect of potentially, you know, adding more tiers. Um, I know there's been yeah. hints of like adding ADV, um, but like I, I think as long as there's a pretty strong and built up enough, I guess, of a, of a following for a particular tier, it has its merit um, to potentially being added, but um, obviously it's up to um, the owner and, and the admin team to to ultimately decide that yeah, yeah i think it's kind of i think it's hit a point now where it's like you don't want to be taking things away i think it's a case if you want to be adding and you want to be expanding and you know reaching out to more communities granted at the same time i say that and i'm also like don't add stuff like lc this is me as an lc <laughs> player <laughs> as an lc player i can agree do not add lc um but yeah i think that the format i like how modular it is so like this idea definitely gives me hope that in like you know future seasons well into the future whether you're adding adv whether you're adding a new gen uh i have faith that we'll definitely co keep coming up with new and fresh ideas for incorporating the different metas uh i think that this gives me a lot of hope for that for sure yeah because if it was a constantly a case of keep adding gens and keep having to get rid of gens like it's just not the same anymore is it yeah, and I think a lot of uh, older players are very hesitant to rotate ORAS out. Uh, a lot of people really like the gen, uh, myself included. I think it's really fun. Uh, you know, it, it was where we started from, so. Yeah. I do think Casey has to respect it. I also sure. agree. It's probably my favorite generation to play in this format if I were to play it. Like your sign up applause. You did just sign up. <laughs> That, that is that is true um mm. but yeah i guess moving on to the other change that was made this season this was particularly for um generation nine so last generation we had the dynamax mechanic that was introduced but we never were able to implement it into draft league due to it being unbalanced and too gimmicky you know adding like pokeballs to the, the dynamax mon or like only like mons six points and below can dynamax you know it's, it was pretty mickey um, but now we have terrestrialization, um, generation nine's mechanic that we're actually able to implement into this season's, um, format. And that being you're allowed two free Terra captains, um, regardless of the points. Um, but at team preview, all of your Pokemon's types are to be revealed, um, to your opponent. And obviously you get to see your opponents as well. Um, what are your thoughts on this, um, type of Terra rule set? being used for the season. It's definitely something that has grown on me over time. Like initially when I found out about it, which was the day that I was added to like being a DPL admin, would have been around a similar time to yourself. And I found out about that and I was a bit skeptical of the idea at the time. I was thinking, oh, two captains could go hardly wrong. Like here's me just wanting to stick with like the one Terra and then like with tax on it. Because just one free Terra with all the unbans that I did for Smogun Draft Kickoff Tour, we don't talk about that. But anyways, uh, I do think it is a case of, it's grown on me over time, I think L5 has definitely convinced me that it is, like, the idea of opportunity cost, the idea of, like, it's not a case of 50-50 and, oh, got the terror wrong, guess I lose now. Like, I do think it does kind of take that element away, and makes it less of a coin flip, but at the same time, it's still Scarlet and Violet, there's still a bit of a coin flip element to it, as has been said by basically every other captain court. So, I have a pretty complicated opinion on this one. Uh, I will say that uh, initially when this was unveiled, my first reaction was, oh, instead of losing the game when, instead of realizing you've lost the game when the Terra happens, you realize you lost the game at Team Preview. Because you'll see, oh, they brought this Terra, this is not the one I prepped for, yada yada yada. Um, and with two Terra Caps, it heightens it because you're like, oh, I have two Pokemon that could be any type. Um, 
which can definitely be kind of tedious to prep for. Uh, that being said, Terra is definitely a very volatile mechanic. It's not as broken as Dynamax, so there's definitely cases to allow, but it's still very broken. And out of all of the things they could have done, I think that this is generally a step in the right direction. Uh, it's definitely better than um, all of the Tyranty Knights we've been seeing and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, I think that I think it'll be fine overall. Um, it's not it's not perfect, but I think it'll be fine. It's definitely Just looking at. Oh, you can go. Just looking at uh, high caliber games for seven weeks, not seeing a single Tyranty Knight's going to actually be quite nice. I can't lie. <laughs> I mean, there's going to be a lot of room for, for creativity. It's still a very new format, new generation, of course. Um, and we haven't had a whole lot in the 8-mon experience with this outside of, um, I believe, PWS. Um, so I am interested to see how people adapt to it. Um, but I will say, definitely, um, um, in an interview that, that will come out um, later today, um, they mentioned that the prep element is still there. Having to prep for two Terra Captains could be any type. It's going to definitely influence your prep. And then when you go into the game, um, you might have all these tools to kind of counter any which way the Terra Captains can go. But you're going to have to adjust regardless of whatever you prepped just by a team preview. You know what types they are. Um, and if you somehow yeah. don't pack, pack coverage yeah. for that type because you just straight up didn't expect it, then you're going to have a, a tougher time adjusting mid game yeah i think um and being able adaptability is definitely going to be key uh not the ability the the skill <laughs> um but the ability's uh, yeah i think that's going to be key because uh a lot of times a lot of players kind of like to have the entire game kind of solved going into a dpl game because you just do so much prep and so much practice but at the end of the day this is really going to force sv players to think on their feet and i think that that's a really a valuable skill, and I'm glad it, it, it's having a chance to be heightened, I guess. I think it's very much the opposite problem that was uh, when we introduced Sword and Shield into DPL. I think yeah. it's very much the opposite problem of that. When we introduced Sword and Shield, you know, it was pre-home decks, everything was very predictable because it was a case of, like, matchups got very samey, and it was like, oh, I don't have a Corviknight, guess I screw real wins. And it was just one of those metas that was very restricting. You didn't really feel like there was a huge amount of flexibility in it. Whereas now, with the introduction of Scarlet and Violet, I think this is very much a case of, like, the flexibility is to the max. And you have to be adaptable and you have to be dynamic with your prep. And you can't just sequence it out because not everything is going to go the way you want it to. Yeah. You have to accept that. I mean, SV is just, like, a vol it's such a volatile metagame. It's, like, the exact opposite of Swish. And I think a lot yeah. of players are kind of refreshed by that right now. Agreed. Myself included sounds good um i guess we can move on to some more auction related topics now um and the first thing i kind of wanted to ask are i guess is how confident um do you feel going into this auction of course it's in uh, a little more than 24 hours at this point um do you have any like reservations or concerns you're stressing about it um or do you feel pretty confident um, going into it already so I think that we definitely need to address the elephant in the room, which is the extra 25k. I think a lot of people are like definitely expecting us to get like the most broken bonkers team with the extra 25k, you know, get all the players we want. I I think our team will still be pretty good. I don't know if it's possible to meet some of these people's expectations with just the extra 25k. It definitely helps, don't get me wrong. Um, but it's also kind of a double-edged sword because the other teams need one less player and they already have their really good player for 25k. So uh, it's definitely going to be interesting to see uh, how we can leverage that in the auction. I think it is a case that uh, there's a lot more layers into the auction process than people probably realize because with the extra 25k, you kind of just have a target on your back, especially for that like round one. Because of the fact that, like, oh, you know, oh, these guys are the extra money, you know, let's, like, run that price up and get their budget down as much as possible. So, like, you do have to be very smart with your early approach because you can't just make your intentions known very early because people will get very aggressive. And while, yes, that could backfire, 
you know, it, there's just multiple layers of thinking that goes on top of it. And that's why I think, you know, myself and Cookie have done a lot of time just like spent thinking about how do we want to approach this. And I think as well with the fact that we're not the only ones with the extra 25k. I hacker and Ian. It's a case of like, oh, but what if we like the guy that we want is the same as the guy that they want? When do we pull out? When do we keep going? Like there's just a lot of layers of thinking that has to go into it. And that's what makes it exciting. Yeah, what a lot of people have been telling me is that the extra budget won't really come into play as much with the higher tier picks, more so the mid tier picks. Uh, I think to that, I just say, like, I guess we'll just have to wait and see if that's true or not. But that's just what I've been hearing around the block. Yeah. Like, if it gets to the mid auction and we still have that extra budget, I think that is very beneficial. However, do I think that is 100% going to be the case? No. Because I do think there could be teams that kind of come out of the blocks very aggressive trying to get us to spend the money. Just so that like mid-auction is more even. Especially because of the fact that with the signups, I think the quality is going to be in those kind of mid-budget picks. Because of the fact that like, you see the early picks, like they kind of look a bit predictable at the moment. And when they kind of spread themselves out. Like if it's a case of we have the more budget and we can kind of pick and choose in that next two down who we want, then like things are going very well. Yeah, I think it'll definitely be a matter of, you know, who you actually want to draft yourself um, and who else is willing to draft it. I mean, if no one's willing to raise the price, you're going to get away with, you know, all of these what quote unquote budget budgeted picks or picks you think are of, of good value for not like reaching you know, your max range. Um, so ultimately, you could have like extra budget, um, but you also have the flexibility to be as aggressive as you want to be um, early, because if you really want a player, you can just dead set be like, I want this player. Um, and if you reach a really high value, you have the ability to pull out and you basically have drained a ton of the budget of another team. Yeah, there's definitely that aspect to it. So it just sort of depends on what, uh, what the other teams really want to do. Uh, it, and, it, it all it all boils down on uh, auction day. Yeah, and who gets known when as well. That's going to be very important. For sure, you don't for sure. know when people are going to be kind of more laid back with their budget and when people are going to be like, right, we need to push. We need to get this price up. So, and I believe a lot the, of layers to it. I believe the auction order is out, and I think you're third. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we're third. quite happy with that. We will take it. And you don't want first now with the extra 25k budget because that is asking for trouble. But yeah, I think the, third kind of balances out. Because it's like, oh, do you know I'm someone you want or do you know I'm like someone else? It's like, uh, and then you gotta wait a while. Yeah. We're still having that dilemma at third, but sure, we'll work it out. Yeah, obviously it depends on like what teams are before you because like if you think a certain team's gonna have, you know, similar interest of another player, um, then that might play into you know be you being able to see like okay what are they actually who are they trying to throw off with their first pick or like are they actually trying to get a certain player first um so yeah it should be interesting dynamic um and i'm excited to see how you guys auction and like ian and hacker auction um with the extra 25k for sure yeah definitely be interesting to see and then I guess the other auction topic I want to ask about is particularly with the player sign-up pool. Um, are there any returning players you see on the sign-up list that you kind of expect to drop off a little in performance? And it could be for a multitude of reasons. It could be um, they're probably, like, maybe they're not going to get the team support or the team environment that allowed them to flourish in the first place. Um, be like IRL things. Uh, it be a matter of like, um, like, for, say, for example, if you're like a captain now, um, you're playing less games. So obviously your opportunity to have like a high record is going to be less than it was before. Like all considering all those factors, like are there any like players you kind of expect to drop off from last season? Uh, I guess I can... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to let you go, but sure, that's fine. I'll go. I think it's one of these things of like an environment for a team is very important when it comes to a season by season basis. So like I'm not going to throw anyone particularly under the bus because the last time I made a definitive call out, I called the team a ticking time bomb and they went on to win the championship. <laughs> so uh, I'm not going to make that mistake a second time. 
So I think for me, it's kind of like keeping an eye on, say, like the Noble Victory guys, the uh, the TGM guys, just to see, like, you know, can they keep that level up? And then in terms of like the opposite swing, in terms of who I expect to do better, like obviously myself, because you know, coming off yet another disappointing 0 and 4 season, can't let that happen again. Uh, Vess, as funny as it would be for him to go like one and six again, uh, I do expect him to do better. I. I think he is just going to hold himself to a standard of this can't happen again. So I do think he'll do better. And I will just lastly stop picking on my boy Cookie, man. Everyone's <laughs> saying like, "Oh, he's the most obvious person to drop off." Like, bro, <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting here thinking like, "Oh, finally, our team's up. They can't say my name." And then you were like, "Oh, watch out, maybe the DGM guys." I just <laughs> had to say it. You yeah, had to say it. <laughs> That's why I was like, you know, I needed to make sure I pointed it out to you. Like, you can very much do it again. Like, you know, people yeah. sleeping on you. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of a difficult question because, like, you just you just don't know what teams people end up on, and I don't really see any of. And to all the captains that like did well last season, I don't see them like doing any worse or anything. Um. Yeah, I I've been, I was thinking about this one for a while. I just don't have a good answer. Maybe like. I don't know. Uh, Emil's the goat, but like six and two is like a really good record last season. Uh, so it really depends on what team he gets on as to whether or not you hear him replicate that. Yeah, there's so many variables when it comes to like an individual performance in a season that is kind of hard to say before you even know a single thing. Like that'll be an easier question to answer post auction. I feel. Yeah, I agree. And then I guess we can transition from auction related questions um and i want to specifically ask about your style of captaining and how you view yourself as a captain um how would you describe your role as a captain your style of captaining in, in one word my word would be determined i am very determined to put my best foot forward this season i'm very determined to give it my all in all of my games in the auction in the drafting and everything I'm very determined to make this season happen. I think for me, the word that I would use is thorough. I think I'm very much, I will pin down that depth, like that minor detail, just to make sure that everything, like I will leave no stone unturned this season. Like everything will be like by the book to the T. So yeah, I'll go with thorough. Determined and thorough. That's a good combo to have. <laughs> Sounds good on paper. Yeah. I believe you guys can can execute it, execute it well. Um, and then I guess getting to the the most anticipated fun part. portion, the fun part. Um, the fun part. Are there any specific captain cores uh, that you want to strongly beat and play this season? And if you want to send a message to them now, you may do so. I'm going to kick this off with a bit of a team name explanation, and it'll make sense in a second. So, for the 95% of people watching this video that doesn't know what an offseer is, uh, Cookie and myself are massive Xenoblade fans, and an offseer is someone in those games that plays a melody, typically on a flute, uh, for those that, for like the departed souls in battle. So, you know, when we do trance all of these people, you know, we'll at least send you off nicely afterwards. So, keep that in mind, other captains. Keep that in mind. No, but on a real, I think it is one of these things of... In terms of particular captains, there's none that really stand out. Like, obviously, Kaz would be nice to get revenge on for Clash. Uh, Vestas, it would be funny to shut them up. But, like, overall, I'm kind of just going into it as, like, I just want to win. Doesn't matter who's in front of me, I just want to win. Bring it. Uh, I really only have one thing to say, uh, and it's for it's to the captain who said my name several times in his interview, to Vesuvius. Literally don't give a shit about what you think, you disgust me. That's all. Yeah. We may be the underdog, but we're still going to talk our game. So. And to, uh, I guess to all the other captains, good luck with your season. Smile. Yeah. Like... We have respect for most of you. Wish is the best, but you know, I hope we're not going to wish you to win because why would we do that? 
I do hope, even with the people you respect, there's a little bit of, you know, friendly banter um, during the season. That's always fun yeah. for the, the spectator experience. Yeah, yeah I, think sure. that's the, I think that's the type of people that Cookie and I are. Like, we're not, it's not going to reach a point of just bad blood. It's just going to, like, it's going to be friendly. It might get a little heated, but it will never be anything, like, super serious. So, I know usually uh, you, you guys seem pretty well uh, grounded kind of keep to yourself um you'll be determined but you won't be like disrespectful and thorough. yeah for sure and for thorough sure. yes and thorough determined and thorough but yeah you won't be disrespectful about it i know for me like i always tried to reel my team in have them not talk externally um but i don't know after winning last season i kind of like don't care much about this especially since i'm i'm in the player pool now um yeah I kind of feel like a bit of a. I want to be an instigator. <laughs> so we'll yeah. see. Your mind has shifted. Yeah. Your mind has shifted solely to the content now, and that's a problem. <laughs> content bot for sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't want anything too serious. <laughs> it is. It is Pokemon at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is literally a game made for children. Let's have fun. Isn't that what we all are at the end of the day? I guess. <laughs> Massive children. Some of us more than others. Well, so much fun. I will leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, your whole thing about respect, I'm, I'm sort of like stopping at it in the dirt, but uh, I mean, uh, what do you expect? Like, how else am I supposed to respond to that? Yeah, you gotta defend your yeah. defend yourself. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And then, finally, the last question I want to ask is based solely on the captain course, because we don't have the entire roster. The auction is tomorrow. Um, and based on the captain's prior you know, experiences, successes, failures, what four teams do you predict to make the playoffs this season? Yeah, I guess I can start. Uh, well, if anyone's gonna believe in us, it's gotta be us, right? So I'll say ourselves, um, gotta have that confidence. Uh, other teams, I think uh, Infernal Armory has a very strong cap core. Uh, the Family and uh, the Cake Takers, I think just by captains alone, those are who I would pick. Well, Cake Takers or um, L2P, that's pretty strong. And that's not even like, the other captains can totally make it. It's just, you know, this is a if you had to pick four type question. So there you go. Yeah, I'm pretty much in the same boat as you, Cookie. <laughs> Both. Uh, I I do think it's a case of like we've got to back ourselves, and I do think we are very much capable of doing so. I think the family and Infernal Armory are kind of like the two standout cores that I do think they will get them into playoffs. And then that last spot I do think is going to be tight, but uh, I'm going to back Kaz and Saidu. I'm going to back L2P, but I do think that's one of those that like could come down to like games one, like it'll be that tight. So for sure, it that's usually does. It usually yeah. does anyway. Exactly. Like, exactly. nobody likes, you know, first four seeds being boring and, like, decided very early. So. Yes, of course. I, I mean, I would, it would be hype if there was a season where, like, the top four were all four and three, and then, like, the bottom four were all three and four. So it was just, like, an absolute dogfight at the end of the season. Yeah. That would be crazy if it was, like, all, every team was three and three going to the last week. So it was basically four play it. It was basically like four play in series mm -hmm. but yeah i believe will never happen we'll see so you mentioned three teams i assume the fourth one would be yourself yeah i said i said ourselves yeah i said uh, we've got to back ourselves so i did say ourselves okay okay i, I must have missed it <laughs> um, <laughs> no worries it seems like for the most you are living you are on five hours sleep so. yes that is that is true um <laughs> but it seems for the most part um Every interview I've done so far has had, I believe, the family and Infernal Armory. Is there a reason why you think those two continue to, I guess, get that respect to make the playoffs? And um, do, you, do you not have any reservations about them this season? Like perhaps they could miss or they could not work out the way you think they're going to work out? So your question was solely based on the cap cores, and I think that pretty objectively, uh, all things considered, those are the two strongest cores just based on playing ability. Of course, we still have to see who they draft. You can't win series with just your captains. 
So there's obviously, you know, a fair chance that they, you know, fib in the auction and miss out, uh, maybe draft poorly. There's so many factors that go into it. Um, but I think pretty objectively, they're like the, the two highest skill tacklers. I think that's pretty universally agreed on. Yeah, completely agree with what you said. Like, it is just the case of they have the track record, so you kind of expect them to replicate it again. And I doubt that, like, Astro's going to go into it and, like, struggle with Captain. He seems like the type of person that would just kind of naturally fit into that mold. And he's someone in L5 with, like, the most experience there is to kind of guide him along. I mean, Sean, you would know better than we do, because uh, you were on his team last season, but I heard he, like, took a bit of a leadership role, was very active and stuff like that, so... I've heard a lot of people say like he would be a related captain, like even at like last season. I heard a bunch of people say that. Yeah, originally he wasn't going to sign up to be a captain, but uh, last season, and I even approached him um, when captain signups came out. I told him he should probably captain. I feel like he'd be great for that. He'd be a great leader in that role. Um, but I did say probably find a good pair um, that will help kind of reel you in because sometimes he can overthink and spiral in it, especially in tie breaks. That's what I saw last season. Um, and I think L5 is probably one of the more most grounded um, captains or players just in the in the format. I think he's going to do very well with uh, with Aster. Sean playing shoot with these, with these captain cores is quite funny. <laughs> it was Aster and L5 and then you had a bit of an effect on us as well, so... <laughs> Just thought I'd point that out. But yeah, I hope um, that's all I have for you guys. I hope you guys you know, enjoyed. I appreciate you participating in these, uh, these little captain interviews. It's been fun for me to kind of get everyone's thoughts, and everyone seems to be pretty chill uh, for the most part. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having us. Uh, I've enjoyed listening to the other interviews. Uh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Today, the other interview has been a lot of fun. Looking forward to seeing the rest of them. And before we go, a shout out to Obi for the logo. I'm sorry for the amount of, I'm very sorry for the amount of like minute details I pulled you up on like constantly. I, I do apologize. I, I felt I kind of went a bit on over the top at times, but like, man, I'm so happy with it. He just has a great oh. vision and um, he's able to execute it very well. I feel like he, oh, he exceeds he does, expectations. Yeah. He really exceeds expectations. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. So, shout out to Obi. Do the goat. Really, really uh, hates the immersion. Having like good logo, good, you know, everything. There's just, it's a team tour. There's so many factors that go into it. So, yeah. Any, any thumbs up is a thumbs up. Yeah. Thank you everyone for watching. If you go down to the description, make sure to join the DPL Discord server. Uh, the live auction will be on Sunday, February 5th at 5 p.m. PST, and uh, the deadline is today at 5 p.m. PST. Um, I don't know when this video will come out, either it will be still open or the deadline will have passed, but um, yeah, make sure to, to catch the live auction. It was very fun to watch live. Um, it's a great experience, um, especially with all the emote spams. But yeah, thank you guys for watching, and I'll catch you guys in the last couple Captain interviews. Peace.